everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Pacific Seamounts Expedition, an exploration of Canada's only known and deepest seamounts and the life that depends on these underwater mountains. Just a few housekeeping things before we begin. Um, your audio has been muted and video is turned off, so you'll only see hosts on video, including myself when I turn it on. There we go. <laughs> yes, I just forgot to do that myself. I tell you, that we did practice this, but uh, sometimes those buttons just disappear on you. I know. All right, everyone, we would love to hear your questions today. Um, so please uh, go into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you'll come up with a box like this where you can uh, enter your question and send it to us, and we'll do our very best to get through as many questions as we can today. This broadcast is brought to you by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Council of the Haida Nation, New Channels Tribal Council, and Ocean Networks Canada. Okay, so we have several hosts for today. I am Jennifer, I work at Ocean Networks Canada, and I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Wasinich peoples. Sabrina, Jared. Hello everybody, um, my name is Sabrina Crowley. My new channel name is Hu Yik. I'm from the ho Sit tribe, and I'm the Southern Region Biologist for the New Channel Tribal Council of Uwaltlik Fisheries Department. And I'm here in Port Alberni in the traditional territories of the Hoopachesset and Shishat First Nations. Wonderful. Jared. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jared Dick. My new channel name is Wes Wistonup. Um, from the Hoopachesset First Nation. And I too am joining you in Port Alberni from the territories of Hoopachesset and Sisha First Nation. And I'm the central region biologist, so uh, a little bit more north up in Clackwood Sound uh, for the New Channel Tribal Council Fisheries Department. What luck. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, wonderful. Welcome. Uh, Heidi. Hello, everybody. My name is Heidi, and I am with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. I'm part of the deep sea ecology team, and this year just providing support from onshore. And I come to you from the traditional territory of the Wasanic and the Lekwungen speaking people. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, uh, Jessal Juice is in the field and she can't make it today. Um, so we'll move on to Monica. Thank you. I'm Monica and I am with Ocean Networks Canada as well. And I'm also joining um, from the traditional territories of the Wasanich peoples. Fantastic. And joining us from at sea are marine biologists, Dr. Charisse Dupree and Tammy Norgard. I believe uh, Charisse, you're here with us. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, I'm here and so is Tammy, but Tammy is just behind camera right now. She'll pop in uh, at opportune time. So, but I'm so happy to be joining you today. I uh, work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada in the same program as Heidi in the Deep Sea Ecology Program. And I am coming to you live from the middle of the ocean. Um, I'm aboard the Canadian Coast Guard ship Tully. And we right now have sent a submersible down to the seafloor. And that's what you're seeing play live behind me. So we're 350 kilometers offshore and about 500 meters deep right now. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to get back to Tammy real soon and Cherise. That is very exciting. You're that you're that lonely blue dot out on that map. <laughs> and uh, for this event, we are excited to have one school joining us from Kayukit. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Uh, this is awesome. Okay, so for our broadcast today, uh, we're going to provide a really brief background for the Pacific Seamounts Expeditions. We're going to answer your questions. And using the Q&A function, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to the marine biologists at sea on this boat, the J.P. Tully. So we're going to talk about species because species are a working part of a natural system and they provide essential services to sustain life, not only for the other creatures around, um, but for us as well. They provide uh, oxygen, food, nutrients, habitat, protection. They're just an extremely diverse and uh, interesting group. 
So we do have to talk about species loss. Um, in fact, species loss, otherwise known as extinction, is a natural part of our planet's history. However, recent rates of species loss are much greater than the natural rates, up to 100 to 1,000 times greater than natural rates of extinction. And this is primarily caused by human activities that um, are causing over-harvesting, pollution, habitat loss, and climate change. So one of the things we're doing to combat this is MPAs or marine protected areas. These are areas of the ocean that are protected from things like fishing, mining, boat traffic, oil and gas exploration. Um, and this can really help reduce the loss of marine species. Canada is committed to achieving a global goal of protecting 30% of our ocean by 2030. And to help achieve to help achieve this goal, Canada is considering the protection of its seamounts. Um, seamounts are very important to our First Nation partners. Um, and so to talk about that, um, I'm going to invite Sabrina and Jared to tell us a little bit. So yes, um, seamounts, well, they're, they're their own unique communities. Um, they provide not only an environment, but also they provide food to sea creatures in the ocean uh, just by how they're shaped. So um and First Nations have lived along the coast and have utilized their sea resources around us for thousands of years for food, bartering, and even more present day, um, just to earn a living. So it's important to understand that everything has a role in the environment in contributing to life and stability, and sea mounts are one of them. Hi, everyone. Yeah, just to add to that. So, you know, as the biologists will get into, you know, these seamounts are an area of increased productivity. And so that increased productivity through the connections of the food web also translate into, you know, increasing the productivity of the local species that we harvest, you know, halibut, lingcod, rockfish, salmon, you know, they're all interconnected. And, and so the increased production from these unique um, ecosystems helps provide um, product productivity and um, food for the the sea resources we all know and love. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So, um, exactly what is a seamount? So, a seamount is an inactive or extinct submerged volcano. Uh, they're at least a kilometer in height, which is pretty big compared to many of our local mountains. And they're considered to be biological hotspots. And a biological hotspot just means that there's more life that lives on and around the seamount. And this is in part because of the interaction of the ocean with the seamounts. Uh, which causes cold nutrient rich water to move up into the sunlit waters. And this leads to phytoplankton blooms that in turn feed the seamount community. The phytoplankton blooms and then it falls out on top of the seamount. There's that button again. There we go. Seamounts in turn attract lots of marine mammals, seabirds and fish who use them um, as nursery grounds. And um, we're hoping, uh, Sabrina and Jared, can you tell us a little bit more about this? So yeah, this is just a good example of what you've gone over of the new channel principle, Hishukish Sawak. So meaning everything is one. So seamounts, they create this unique community, bringing a lot of different sea creatures together um, to one area and all kind of working together. So um, in this, so Hishukitsawak, it just fits well of how seamounts operate. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we do have a question here. Uh, how were seamounts discovered? Uh, I think I'm going to pass this one to Sharice for answering. That's a great question, and uh, I'll give you I'll give you two flavors of how we discover seamounts. I'll give you the easiest one. Um, a lot of seamounts used to be islands, and so we would know about them because of them being above sea level. 
And then through erosion, they go back into the ocean. And once they go below the surface of the water, they're considered seamounts. And so a good example of this, this is the Hawaiian island chain, where we can see the islands above the sea level. And as you move away from that hot spot, you get to the older islands that actually go back into the ocean and become seamounts. So that's an easy clue because we can see it. What's a little bit tougher is when we have seamounts that have never broken the surface of the water. So they've never been islands. And we use um, ship-based tools and satellite tools to try to detect anomalies. So we look for that change in the, the surface of the sea. And it's very much like you would expect um, a mountain to protrude out of a valley. So we use sonar sometimes. Um, we use the rising of the, the sea level over the, the seamount itself. And uh, so we have different tools at our disposal. Uh, between you and me, if you could see it as an island and then it submerges back into the ocean, that's the easiest one. Uh, off the coast of Canada, we're using the ship-based method right now. Um, so sound penetrating through the water to map out the seafloor. And that is how we discover new seamounts. Thank you. Fantastic. So actually, there's a related question to this, actually. I, I'm going to give you a, a two-part question because I love those two-part questions. How old do you have to be to do this work? That actually has come right from our audience. And please continue to ask questions using the Q&A. Um, and then uh, the follow-up is, yeah, when you started, what was the, the your favorite thing you found in the deep sea? Oh, that's a two-parter. That's okay. a two-parter. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> So if I forget the second part, by the time I get there, you'll <laughs> remind me. Um, but how old do you have to be? Well, uh, to come out on the ships with us and to be part of the, the expedition crew, um, I believe uh, we've taken uh, first, not first year, uh, but undergrads at university. So we've had older teenage uh, teenagers on here. We've had uh, students um, doing their undergrad or their um, their masters. Or uh, I, you know, I don't want to throw people under the bus, but Josh was really young, and he he came at it more from the arts and wanting to explore on behalf of his community. Um, so maybe I don't even have to qual qualify that with you know you have to go to university. University. So we've definitely had uh, team members who are in their late teens, uh, early 20s aboard the ship with us. Um, if you want to be a scientist, you know, you got to do that path through university. And that definitely adds some years onto your age. Um, but you can start off young and come on for co-ops or just come on to represent your community or as you're going through school to become a marine biologist. So that would be the first part. Very and then that cool. second part. Yeah, that second part was what's your favorite thing you found in the deep sea? What is my favorite thing that I found in the deep sea? Oh, okay, there, there are a lot. Uh, the one that comes uh, screaming back to me all the time, and I didn't appreciate it because I was one of those young, bright-eyed uh, students when I saw it, is um, I saw a battle between a swordfish and a large Humboldt squid at about a thousand meters below the surface. And I saw them uh, duke it out, um, predator and prey interaction. And uh, who do you think won? I'll throw that question back at you. <laughs> oh, I don't, ooh, I don't know. I, I, maybe the swordfish, he does, he is named after a weapon. Right. He is named after a weapon and I saw him use that sword and he 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 got the he took the day he um, and he had a meal uh, in addition to it. So the swordfish uh, used its bull to, to swack the um, squid. And even though the squid was inking and trying all its defensive moves, the swordfish won. And uh, to this day, it's probably the most phenomenal thing I've seen in, in my career is uh, the battle of the deep, I like to call it. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's really incredible. <laughs> All right. We have another question here. What is uh, your favorite thing you found in the deep sea? What's your favorite thing you found in the deep sea? 
Okay. It might be surprising, uh, but it's pretty topical. Um, mountains. <laughs> so, right, we're here. We're talking about sea mounts. We've talked about how big they are. They can. They have to be over a kilometer high. They can be up to three kilometers in our water. Uh, because so little of the ocean floor has been mapped, we go out on expeditions like this and we find entire mountain ranges that are new to science. And actually, uh, when we started this expedition, we knew of 62 seamounts in our waters. And right now, uh, we're not quite finished the expedition, but we found another three. And it's not that they just popped up. It's that uh, we hadn't been there to map. And I'd say maybe the most surprising thing is that we still find things the size of mountains that were hidden in the deep sea off our coastline. Amazing. That's uh, incredible discoveries being made just off of our coastline here. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. So just to go back to the uh, this map here, the only known seamounts in Canada um, occur in the Pacific Ocean. And they're shown here um, as the yellow triangles. And as you can see, a lot of them occur right off the southern um portion of this area. And this is part of the reason this is a proposed marine protected area. And designating it as a marine protected area um, would protect it from bottom contact fishing and other destructive practices such as mining, um, oil and gas exploration. It would be the biggest marine protected area in Canada. And so to effectively protect and manage this area requires an understanding of what is there because uh, you know, quite simply, if uh, you, you can't protect and manage what you don't know. Uh, and this is this is really true. And of course, the mission of this Pacific uh, Seamount expedition is uh, twofold. One is to describe the location and physical characteristics of these uh, seamounts. Uh, for example, DFO is working with uh, BC's coastal and Indigenous communities not only to find them, but to um, name them, because that's going to be important. But also the second part is to describe species, their abundances and their location with a robot called Boots which is, I think, very adorable. And the robot boots is relatively small, um, which is important because it doesn't um, destroy the animals on the seamount. It allows for observations of species um, behavior. And, and one example that we've had or analogy of using boots is sort of like climbing a mountain with a flashlight in the dark trying to find things, which is actually a very uh, good analogy just because there's so much to see and look at. And uh, there's actually a really great question here um, with how long have you been affiliated with the New Chalnuth Tribal Council? This one is for Sabrina oh. and Jared. <laughs> Pardon me. I, I, I can see that. And of course, I decided not to say it. I just thought it to myself. Pardon me, Sabrina <laughs> and Jared. Yes. So um, this kind of ties into the last question when you're asking about age, too. It's like it, you just have, if you just have an interest and you love science and you love being around your resources. Um, I started off as a summer student um, and, and and we've had students here in the past, like even just coming fresh out of high school and just kind of want to see where they want to go in life and which direction they want to go. Um, and then after that, uh, that was in 2007, I believe. And then 2008, I was like a summer intern. So I just kept, it was interesting. I found it to be working with our resources was just fascinating. And it wasn't until I graduated. So I, there was a two-year diploma or a two-year um, to be the technician, and then I took the Bachelor of Science degree, which is a four-year course in the fisheries and aquaculture, and I graduated from VIU in 2009, and shortly after that, um, I was able to get a position with the New Channel Tribal Council of Wealth Fisheries Department as an associate biologist, and it wasn't until recently, just last year, um, I was um, I, I'm now the Southern Region Biologist. So I've been here for quite some time, and um, yeah, it's been it's it's been a great ride. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jared. 
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I kind of had a similar path, you know, back in high school and even middle school, I was just always interested in sciences, you know, taking the biologies, the chemistries and whatnot. And then, uh, you know, I applied through university. Um, actually, the school kind of forced my hand to to have a spare block of grade 12 and I surprisingly got accepted. And so I thought, well, let's just keep the interest train going and let's just keep going to school and learning more about sciences. And so I went to UVic there and started doing my marine biology undergrad program. And then uh, uh, luckily, the New Challenge Tribal Council every summer offers um, a summer student position that both Sabrina and I did. And so in the summer months between school years, we'd, you know, be the West Luck interns. And uh, I originally wanted to go to school to be a science teacher because I found I had a knack for, um, you know, assisting students with helping on uh, grasping concepts. And I used to uh, tutor a lot of students in high school, and that was my original plan. But then as I went through the summer internships, um, with the West Luck, I learned about how much the Tribal Council and other organizations work towards protecting our resources, you know, salmon, halibut, and all the, you know, resources we rely on for food. And so um, through those internships each summer, I finished my undergrad and then graduated. And luckily, um, I actually covered Sabrina's maternity leave as an associate biologist. And then um, after that, I, uh, luckily, the bio biologist in Tofino uh, stepped down and the position came to be. And so I've been working with the Tribal Council since my first year of undergraduate, um, 2012, and then I've been with them ever since. And so, um, you know, if anyone's ever interested in doing sciences, I say just, you know, study what you're interested in. Um, there's supports like the Tribal Council to help um, fund your schooling and just, just you know, just just commit to it and just never give up and just, you know, be willing to sacrifice the time and, and uh, the stress and, uh, and, and then take advantage of the opportunities like the tribal council offers. And then you'll be a marine biologist and maybe on the ship in no time. Thanks. Thank you. That sounds, it sounds like you can't get started soon enough. Doesn't sound like people need to wait. Sounds like they can dive right in. Absolutely. That's awesome. Loved your stories. Thank you for sharing those. All right, so uh, previous Pacific Seamount expeditions have been quite successful. Um, amongst the many things they've discovered, they've discovered 40 new seamounts, at least 40, 40 new, maybe obviously more than that now, um, and provided highly detailed images of the seamounts, like the one that you're looking at here. And Sharice, we do have a question for you um, about the discovery of these seamounts. How far down can you go and how does Boots move is the question. Right, so while we can map the seafloor to, to the bottom, um, Boots is limited in its depth. So off, um, off our coastline, the ocean goes to 3.5 kilometers, uh, which is incredibly deep. Boots can go down to 2,000 meters. So some of the seamounts we can reach almost in their entirety. Other seamounts, though, we can just skim the summit of them. Um, and then some are actually so deep that they're beyond our reach. So boots can go down to two kilometers, 2,000 meters. How boots moves is actually boots was originally designed as a drop camera, which and I'm going to over, oversimplify this a lot, um, is a GoPro on a string, except the string is two kilometers and the GoPro is about the size uh, of, a, of a small golf cart kind of thing. Um, so oversimplified. But um, what it means is that Boots doesn't have any thrust to it or directionality. And we rely on the precision navigation of the ship to actually move us around. So from control, we are in constant contact with the bridge. And you could actually probably hear in the background the rumbling noise. That's the dynamic positioning of the ship doing the meter increments that allows for boots to go exactly where we want in real time. And then what we have the ability to control from the control room, other than directing with the bridge, so the captain on where to go, is we can go up and down. Uh, so now I'm turning our GoPro on a string analogy into a yo-yo. And so we can, we can make uh, boots fly up cliffs and go into valleys. Um, but before our dive, we 
pre-plan a route, we share it with the bridge. And so we know the forward direction we're going to go. And all we have to take care of down here is the up and down and all the camera motion. Oh, that is amazing. I had no idea that it required so much precision on the behalf of um, the captain and the crew to maneuver the ship to move boots. That's incredible. Yeah, we are very fortunate with uh, how closely we work with the Canadian Coast Guard on uh, on science vessels like uh, the Tully. Well, and it, it's amazing that you can do that because, you know, these this expedition, as well as previous Seamounts expeditions, have helped identify many species and documented their numbers um, and location and sometimes behaviors, which is really exciting. Um, and this is really important to creating MPAs, but it also helps, helps us understand impacts from fishing gear, climate change, ocean acidification. Um, I'm going to give this question to Heidi. And specifically um, related to the identification of species, what requirements do you need to start this kind of work? How do you know it's a new species? Great, thank you. Yeah, um, it's amazing what's been found in the seamounts or on the seamounts off of our coast. Um, like Cherie said, we actually know more about the surface of the moon and even maybe Mars now than we do about our deep oceans. So every time we go out, we're learning something new about the depth these animals can be found out, the interactions they have with each other. And yes, we're often looking with um, video imagery to try and identify these species. But unfortunately, a lot of the time to actually get an animal down to specific species, we have to look at really fine detailed features. So this year we're out with boots, but there have been years when we're out with remotely operated vehicles, such as maybe you've heard of Ropos on our coast. And these are um, robots or submersibles that have arms or collecting capabilities. And um, the years that we've done that, it's been really advantageous because what happens is we can go down, we can look at these animals and we can take little snippets of them. So for example, on a coral, we take part of the branch. Um, and what scientists have to do is they have to then look at the, the fine features on that. So for example, from the Seamount's work, we had this incredible taxonomist named Dr. Henry Reiswig who works on glass sponges. And he has already described four new species to science from our Seamount's. There was another six at least underway of being described. And what he does is he takes that fine um, scale structure they make their body literally out of glass but he breaks down all the elements and how they fit together and by looking at those little pieces he can describe new species to science so it's not just the overall body shape but sometimes the little units and so um, it really does depend on the animal what you need to get this kind of work started and then I would just say as a scientist, it's actually a really neat thing that once you start wanting to put a name on something, you can't stop it. <laughs> so uh, what requirements you need is really good keys and really good books and sometimes a microscope. Hey, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is actually um, really important work and a lot of um, and an opportunity for um, a career too. We need people to be identifying species. All right, so um, now while previous expeditions um, to these seamounts have focused on the shallower seamounts, this expedition has focused on deeper seamounts that are farther away from light. Um, they're exposed to higher temperatures and lower, um, higher pressures, pardon me, and lower temperatures. Um, so let's go to Charisse and Tammy and hear about what they have discovered about these deeper seamounts. And uh, just a reminder to please keep those questions coming in through the Q&A and we'll relay them uh, to Charisse and Tammy. So uh, Charisse, what have we discovered or you discovered about these deeper seamounts? I mean, yeah, let's call it we because uh, we are we're streaming out to the whole world while we're doing this. And I feel like we have a massive community um, that's, you know, going through this adventure and this this discovery with us. So let's keep it as we and I can. Yeah, I'll summarize what we've discovered so far. So we've been out here, uh, I think, nine days. Uh, it's either that or three months. You lose track of time when you're out at sea. Um, 
We've been out here for over a week. And aside from the new sea maps that we discovered that I told you about, we've, uh, we've seen some animals behaving in ways that we, we didn't know they would and we haven't documented yet. And uh, one of the neatest was we believe we found a nursery ground for deep sea skates on the top of one of the sea maps. So these skates were moving up to shallower slopes to lay their eggs. And the shallowest slope out in the, in the deep sea ended up being this pinnacle of this very narrow, thin sea mount. And it ended up that all the slopes of the sea mount, which started as a large base, concentrated on this one little pinnacle that, as far as we can tell, is only, you know, a hundred or so meters across. It's not very large. And on it was a massive coral and sponge garden. And so it concentrated all the skates coming up from the deep to lay their eggs. And we ended up seeing just a seafloor covered in eggs. And it speaks to the ecosystem services of seamounts and how important they are. And every time we come out here, we're just, uh, we're uh, discovering a new ecosystem service that they provide for deep sea animals. And so those skates will go back into the deep and live out the rest of their lives. But their young have this amazing nursery ground. They can hide amongst the corals and the sponges, grow larger, and then start their descent into the into the deep sea. So that was a phenomenal discovery that we made. And uh, I, I think if you follow our hashtag Pacific Seamounts 2021, uh, you could see some of those photos where in about a, a meter square frame, uh, you see tens to a hundred eggs in one shot. Um, so we're still trying to wrap our mind around that because that just happened and uh, never before seen. So uh, pretty exciting. Um, we also saw a ghost jellyfish. Um, we also saw a ghost jellyfish and we are the eighth science group in the last 30 years to do so, which is incredible. Um, we saw it uh, as we were descending into the depth. Again, that's on social media, a massive purple jellyfish with really long tentacles. That was really exciting. Um, I'm going to look at the screen behind me. Uh, we're on Union Seamount right now, which we've been to before, but we're, we've had a phenomenal flight for the last five hours, and we've been in a dense field of brittle stars, and that isn't something that we've experienced before either. We've seen these dense mats of brittle stars, but none that have gone on for so long. So it's basically on every dive, we're discovering something new. We're seeing animals extend further, uh, live deeper, move shallower in higher concentrations. It's basically every time we go into the ocean. Oh my goodness, sorry. I'm just seeing in the screen that we're having a lot of really large thorny heads um, and, and we haven't quite seen ones that large before. So uh, I, get, I get my attention distracted there. Uh, <laughs> I'll also point out that we had a neat um, observation of a whale full, and that's something we've never seen before. So we saw the skeletal remains of what we think is a baleen whale on the side of one of these seamounts. I could I could go just, on. It just doesn't stop every day. It just no. doesn't stop. It's incredible. I'm gonna really. leave. I'll leave the frisbee story for later too. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, interesting. Could ask more questions about those uh, skates and and the sea mounts that they do. They choose certain sea mounts, or is it circulation that just brings them to those sea mounts? I, I mean. It was, it was a very near shore seamount, actually just off the coast, off the southern point of um, Haida Gwaii. It's our closest coastal seamount. Um, so we're going to have to work up the data. We're going to look at the oxygen, the salinity, the temperature, everything to figure out why. Um, I have been looking at the published primary literature, and it does seem like the skates like a very particular habitat. Now, this skate was actually only discovered uh, about seven years ago, brand new to science and, and not known before then. So the literature on it is, is kind of sparse. Um, so once we work up and describe what the conditions were of that nursery, it'll be, well, that's what's known about the nursery and the juveniles, because before that, we didn't know it existed, which is 
basically what happens every day on these ships. Right, right. And, and having the new technology, you can see those things with other, like the past or traditional technology, you couldn't see those things. Well, and it certainly yeah, emphasizes... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. It certainly emphasizes the importance of protecting it. If that were to be damaged or, or mm. changed in some way, mm. even before you have a chance to understand it, you may never see anything like it again or since. Absolutely, because those corals and sponges that made the nursery ground what it was, um, they take uh, decades to centuries to grow to that size to provide that ecosystem function. And those corals and sponges, they're the animals that are susceptible to climate change. They're the animals that are susceptible to bottom contact fishing. So you're exactly right. It's the importance of, of protecting habitats like that, because uh, even if we don't know and don't have it documented in science, uh, you know, you can pretty much guarantee that, that that is providing an ecosystem service for so many animals in the deep sea that we don't know about yet. We've got a question here. Um, the, why do newly discovered species have to be named in Latin? Heidi. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is actually a kind of an intricated system, but it has to go with uh, the classification of life. So the way that um, a species is given its name is to ensure that um, there's no overlap. So for example, if you think about someone living on the coast of Canada versus on the coast of, say, New Zealand, we could both call something the green jellyfish. It might be the same thing. But by having a genus and lot uh, assigned species names helps with the classification. And this was, um, yeah, so it's related to that. And, but you can assign whatever common name you want. So um, I hope that kind of basically answers the, the, the basics of it is it's like the ancient kind of classification system and how we organized life on the planet is to assign them these names and after genus and species they get put in families just the way that you know we kind of do so um yeah it's a, a weird naming system but it's really funny because sometimes the latin name can give you a clue about the animal so for example if you ever see um the words for example like oregonensis that means hairy <laughs> or um yeah, there's different ones like that. So sometimes the Latin name has a hidden meaning in it as well. All right, I have a question about, um, Sharice, you were talking about um, the age of the animals that live on the seamounts. Why uh, do old and slow growing animals live on seamounts? Yeah, so it's basically everything in the deep sea is a little bit older and a little bit slower than you and me. Um, I think they've figured out a good way of living life. Um, but it has to do with the low amount of food that they get delivered. So they have slow metabolisms. Um, they receive little food from the surface. It trickles down as, as marine snow. Um, I earlier in the expedition calculated just some rough calculations, but the, the deep sea uh, on average where we are receives the equivalent per meter square of 71 grains of sugar per day. And that's all you get. That's all you're allowed to eat. Um, so if you're an animal in the deep sea and you're not even getting a meter square to forage in because you're very small or you're slow moving or you're stuck in one place, um, that's not a lot of energy to, to move around, to live a fast life. So instead their life strategy um, and because of the habitat that they're in, it's very stable, is to live for a very long time, reproduce slowly and just play the, the I'm not going to say the waiting game, but the, the long game. Um, and so actually the oldest living organism on our planet is uh, dated at four and a half thousand years old and it was a black coral in the deep sea environments so they take it to the extreme 
Um, that being said, every so often you'll see a rockfish pass uh, the live view right now that we're looking at. And uh, we're at a place where we see a lot of rough eye rockfish. And even in the shallows of, and I call it shallows, of 500 meters depth, these rockfish live to be over 205 years old. So, um, yeah, they're, they're living uh, slow lives. They're living for a long time. Most of it has to do with the amount of food they get, um, their m metabolism, and their strategy. And how, so does that mean it takes a long time for them to become reproductive? Yeah, so uh, a lot longer in most cases than their shallow water cousins uh, do. So everything will be delayed. Um, yeah, and I believe that rough eye rockfish that I was talking about um, is somewhere in the order of a couple to a few decades before it becomes reproductive. So uh, in their 30s, in their 40s, um, they become reproductive, and then they go on to live the equivalent of, you know, eight generations of our human lifespans, which is uh, pretty incredible. We actually have another question for you, and uh, it, it's actually come in the chat, and it says, get her to tell you how the, you tell the age of a rockfish. So how do you tell the age of a rockfish? Do you just approach it and say, excuse me, you appear to be about 105 years old? That's very rude. They don't like oh. that. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so actually, um, unfortunately, uh, because of the biodiversity and the massive biomass around seamounts, um, they were targeted for fishing. Um, and it's a phenomenon that occurs all over the world. Um, the fishermen... Uh, you know, they know where the catch is, they know where the animals are, um, and it's, it's totally part of our human history. We've targeted those areas. So for a very long time, fisher, uh, fishers have been going out to these seamounts, catching these fish. And so when they've caught the fish, um, I believe they can do age dating on a lot of fish by looking at a bone and the rings um, of that bone in the fish's ear. And so we know um, the age lifespan of, uh, of these rockfish because actually some of our seamounts, including Union Seamount uh, playing on the video screen here, uh, was a fish seamount. And so we do know these species pretty well because unfortunately they were caught. Question about the age. Um, so so they can get really old, some of these invertebrates, so the sponges can get really old. Is it possible to learn about, for example, you know how they look at trees and tree rings and they can find out about past climates and conditions? Mm. Can we do that with these sponges if they live, if we've got examples that are living up to 4,000 years old, yeah, can mm. we look about like past ocean conditions by looking at those Absolutely. There's absolutely there's an entire field of doing these things. It works best for the corals that put down a hard uh, calcium carbonate or aragonite skeleton. And yes, if you if you were to sample that coral, um, they do form rings like trees, and uh, they do tell us about uh, past ocean conditions. Um, and it's something that as, uh, as we start to grapple with climate change more and more, it's a science that's getting a lot more attention um, because we are able to look to these animals as a, as a calendar of what's happened along geological timescales because they're so long lived um, and because they hold that information within themselves. Um, and if you're the right type of scientist and you're able to get those samples, you can tell that story that predates um, humans uh, drastically and gives us a look into what conditions were happening. Uh, a lot of those papers end in um, how do we use that information to predict what's going to happen. And just another reason to protect them. Yeah. Uh, I have a question yeah. for you. What, what, if you uh, what if you get seasick? <laughs> <laughs> what if you get seasick? <laughs> Depends how much you love marine biology. Uh, you know, we all get a little seasick sometimes. Uh, I will, you know, I'm going to take the opportunity here during this question to divert a little bit. Uh, 
I'm on the floor, the, the computer's on a table, the camera is bolted down. I'm actually rocking from side to side quite a bit right now. Um, you do get used to it, but this ship is constantly moving. Um, so some of us feel green for the first couple of days. There's bands, there's patches, there's pills, there's uh, a lucky charm. Uh, we do what we can until we feel better. But those first couple of days at sea, you hope that it gradually works into it. And that's what we experienced on this expedition. It was really nice. It was smooth sailing. And we were about three, four days off the dock before the heavy seas really started to roll in. And it is totally acceptable to be having a conversation with a fellow scientist in this control room. And they just go, excuse me for one moment. And they're gone. So it's part of being out at sea. And uh, I know some seasoned uh, marine biologists who are, you know, just retired or on their way to retiring. And every time they come out to sea, they get seasick, but they love, they love being on the ocean. They love this field work aspect. Um, so they, 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 you know, they stomach it and they come out every time and they, they go through that. I'll also say that um, there's a lot of intertidal work for those who don't want to get seasick. Uh, you can scuba dive, you can you know, you can work on shore, but for me, it's, uh, it's the ocean, uh, being out on a ship. So, you know, I'll, I'll pop the pull. I'll, uh, feel green some days and, uh, anything to be out here on the ocean. I, I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you actually gave us a really great segue. You mentioned the camera, the floor and everything. Um, do yeah. you think you could give us a tour of your quote unquote office that you have right now? To. And and just while you're doing to. that, um, just a reminder that there's room for more questions. We have more time. And, uh, you know, these these experts are here sharing with us, uh, not just yourselves, but also our panelists. So if there are questions, um, please don't be shy. Please use the Q&A. And, and now I'll hand it back to you. Please, let's see the office. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so just to the side of where I was presenting, we have the oceanography laboratory, I'm going to call it, and we have a whole bunch of high, um, you know, value, uh, very sophisticated um, water sampling uh, equipment. We have a, a massive freezer over here, and when uh, the boots team goes to sleep at night, the, the oceanography wakes up like zombies <laughs> in the nighttime and they sample the water column they bring that water back on the ship and they do um experiments right here on board inside the you know the quote unquote office um and then if i scroll over past where i was presenting uh we start to see the techie side of the room sorry it's shaking a little bit here but that's life on a ship so uh who's flying can you put your hand up Hello, is that Jackie's hand? Okay, so Jackie is piloting right now. We give the pilots the really comfy chair. It's like a race car chair. You're sitting down for a really long time. Uh, Jackie has some bright screens in front of her. She's actually looking at the seafloor on some of those very bright screens. But up top there, you can see the sonar that is actually on boots. And it paints a picture of what is coming up so that Jackie can decide whether she's going to go up or down or ask the ship for a move or to speed up or to slow down. And then beside Jackie, we have Ben. Ben, put your hand up. Hey, Ben. So Ben is Jackie's, uh, I'm going to call him a, her assistant right now, but Ben's sitting in the chair that helps control the camera. Uh, Ben's got the navigation, the maps in front of him. Um, so he's checking gauges, communicating a lot with uh, Paul, who's over there. Hey, Paul. Hand up. So Paul is a Zoom master right now. Uh, we have a camera on board that we like to take pretty pictures of. Sometimes we need to get really close into the animals to get those good photographs so that Heidi can ID the species. Uh, so we'll ask Paul to control that. And then backseat driver over here is lead scientist, Tammy Norgard. And uh, she's at the station that has the annotation computers on it. So keeping track of what's happening all the time on the seafloor, communicating with our team in real time that's on shore, watching the dive and asking for specific objectives that we need to get accomplished. And so that's the room. Chelsea, I'm going to do it. It's coming over to you. 
<laughs> oh, it's one of our zombies. <laughs> Chelsea is awake. Um, so Chelsea's uh, the leader of the oceanographic crew. And so she's awake right now for the show. Um, and it's kind of hard to sleep through all the excitement sometimes. So Chelsea's up pretty early. So that's the room. And I'm going to put the mic down and uh, connect the camera again. Thank you very much. Um, uh, another question that we have for you as well um, is, it's, it sounds a little, it's, it sounds subtle, but it's not. Can you tell us about the lids? I'd like to hear about the lids. Uh, this is the most amazing discovery of this expedition was um, we found bucket lids on the seamount. Look, I get distracted. Look at those sponges. Okay, so those sponges, we're really excited about them right now because they're the sponges that make up the um, sponge reefs that you find in the coastal areas. So you guys have probably heard about the sponge reefs. They've become marine protected areas. And we don't usually see that species here. It's called heteroconi. And we only just started seeing it on this dive. And of course, we're making discoveries in real time. So this is just part of interacting with scientists while they're at sea. Um, we're so excited to see this glass sponge on this uh, on this dive. Sorry, what was the question? Bucket lids. No worries. <laughs> and I'll just add as well, if people want to see what you're seeing, they can see that at the Ocean Networks Canada website as well. Um, they don't have to, to tune in and look over your shoulder. They can actually see that on our site as well. So, I mean, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. And then if they follow the slider link, uh, they can tap into the computer that Tammy is working on and your question pops up right there for us. Uh, and uh, you can keep Tammy busy. Uh, <laughs> um, and yes, okay. and yeah. the lids. Right. So we found bucket lids on, um, on a cement that we returned to. But as I mentioned, uh, don't worry, we left the bucket lids there. So those lids were actually markers that we created. And we went to the seamount, Delwood Seamount, um, three years ago. And we had a submersible vehicle that had arms on it. So we had the capacity to take markers down and, and put them on the seafloor. Then we did uh, high uh, resolution imagery of the seafloor, 10 by 10 meter grid around where we put these markers. And we thought, that you know, in the future, if we get a chance, maybe we'll fly by it again, but we didn't know maybe when it would happen, but we just thought, oh, if we mark the physical location, we'll know for sure that we've got back there. So on, on this expedition, we have boots, which doesn't have that capacity to fly around like a submersible, like a ROV. Um, but we thought maybe we'll just try fly by it really slowly and we might find one of these lids. And sure enough, we tried it and we did it. On our very first dive, we descended uh, about a kilometer and a half into the ocean and we landed on a bucket lid, which is the equivalent of going to Mount Baker and looking for a Frisbee you lost there, but it's pitch dark and all you have is a flashlight and a map of where you think you've lost it. So we ended up repeating that five times and we were able to return to these sites. And now this marks the first time that we've collected repeat data on these seamounts. And that repeat data is going to give us an idea of the speed at which these animals are growing, how they're changing in relation to climate change impacts, um, how they're recovering from fishing. So it was incredibly exciting. And I have never been so happy to see a bucket lid in my entire life. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It, it's it. Just listening to you, I realize just how challenging it is to do that work. It, it's, you know, incredible what you're finding. Um, question for you, uh, and it says it's a very serious question. Have you yeah, ever put found? On my serious face. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever found a pineapple under the sea? <laughs> oh. <laughs> we find lots of Patricks. No pineapples. Uh, that's hilarious. You know, that's a real place. Not the pineapple, the bikini bottom. Um, and 
And if you don't know the story behind SpongeBob SquarePants, you should Google it because it's actually got a lot of really interesting science to it. So Bikini Bottom is nowhere near where we are. And I don't think I'd put my uh, submersible on my ship in, a, in an old nuclear test site. But uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Google it and you'll have a newfound respect for the science that goes behind SpongeBob SquarePants. I have to catch up on SpongeBob, clearly. <laughs> clearly. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, have, Monica. Oh, it, well, and, and I, I, I have to, to agree. you got to follow up on that, that SpongeBob stuff because uh, it is very interesting. But here's actually another question. Does the weather ever pre prevent you from going out on the boat? Or, or what happens when you're out at sea and all of a sudden the weather changes on you? What do you do? Yeah. So we are, uh, we are, um, you know, held to a certain restricted uh, ability by the weather. Um, we have had pretty good weather on this expedition. We did have some rough days that made us a little green in the face. Um, uh, not on this expedition. Nothing's prevented us on this expedition from going in the water. But if you think about, um, I think Boots is uh, 1,100 pounds of weight, and then you let out uh, two kilometers of cable, that is a lot of weight pulling on the back of the ship um, and on the frame, the crane that puts out um, the vehicle for us. And so there are, it's usually sea surface um, um, waves that prevent you from going out first. So we can't deploy Boots if Boots is going to be bouncing up and down and potentially breaking that, that equipment um, or damaging the ship. So it's usually wave action that will stop you first, and that could be brought up by, by the wind. Um, rain, fog, you're okay, but it's, it's sea size. And um, in previous expeditions, we've had to look at uh, look at the the map of where the weather systems are, and we've had to run away from the system. But uh, Canada has a very large offshore area, and usually when we run away from a system, we're still over a different type of seamount uh, that we can then make use of our time and dive there. But sometimes it's a cat and mouse game out here. And you have to dodge weather systems um, and they're called weather days and you usually build them into the cruise plan so uh in an expedition you might say okay we we're going to give two days to to loss over weather and do you factor that in uh so that you could run around the ocean uh, without deviating from your plan too much a related question um so weather on the surface, but uh, it says here, aren't there currents under the ocean surface that make it hard to move boots? Yeah, there absolutely are. And we've actually experienced some really high current areas. So seamounts are in part so amazing because they're a big barrier in the ocean that, um, that makes current, uh, like the ambient current around, deviate and speed up because it's got to get over this big roadblock that's being put in front of it. So CMATs tend to accelerate ocean currents. And so, oh, <laughs> and so um, we often experience very high currents at CMATs and we'll see um, the camera start to shake a little bit when, when we get that flow. Um, we haven't had such high currents that we've had to leave, but we've definitely had to change our plan and maybe we can't we can't go against the current. We have to go 90 degrees to it or something like that. So we're definitely um, subject to the current too, but we usually have enough um, different plans that we can make, take another route. Uh, yeah, so Boots is pretty heavy. And so uh, it can fight the currents a little bit, but there's definitely a certain amount of current that would make us change our plans or even have to leave. All right. Okay, I think we're, uh, our questions um, are complete here. And um, Sabrina, um, can I, Sabrina or Jared, uh, would you like to mention? Um, go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just kind of want to mention how the New Toronto Tribal Council got involved with this the sea expedition and shootings going forward. So um, back uh, in 2019, uh, Tammy Nogard there from DFO approached our boss, Eric Angel, in the lead up to the expedition about having two New Channel representatives on the expedition. And after an open invitation invitation uh, for New Channel community members uh, was sent out through our social media channels um, and through our capacity building coordinator, uh, we found my cousin, Joshua Watts, who is an ocean and atmospheric sciences student. She participated along with our coworker, uh, Alin Carrier, who works for Uatla Fisheries. Uh, but unfortunately this year, due to code restrictions, which are limiting the number of people aboard the vessel, there are no new child community reps on board the expedition. And uh, kind of tying back to what the questions that were asked earlier about you know, how to get more involved, I'd say, you know, Go to our Uathluck Facebook page or Instagram and give it a follow and then go to our Uathluck um, website and there will always be um, job postings and opportunities posted on the on the social media and on the website. So, you know, if there's opportunities in the future for New Channel members to join on, join on these expeditions, um, that's where you'll be able to find out about them. And I also was told that in the future, there may be opportunities for the Channel to name some of the seamounts. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you, Jared. Uh, Monica. Yeah, actually, just, just before we, we go to the end, I did also want to uh, mention we um, unfortunately, we're unable to connect with one of our our other guests, Laïs, who is going to join us and tell us um, a little bit about um, the Haida and her experience. And so we've actually got a, a link to a video that we'll put in the chat to share because, of course, that's also an important part. Um, so that and this is about um, the one of the seamounts as well. So Lauren's just put that in the chat for people to check out as well. And um, looking at the time, of course, um, we just want to say thank you for everyone who's been here and joined us and provided us with these amazing questions. Um, of course, we have to thank, um, whoop, <laughs> we're going to see, see everybody that we have to thank, which is great. Um, we have, of course, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, Ocean Networks Canada, Council of the Haida Nation, New Channel Tribal Council, um, these folks here, and of course, um, the crew of the JP Tully. Um, can't, uh, can't go out there without them. Um, well, you could, but it'd probably be, be cold and wet and lonely. And so instead we've got, got them to thank as well. And of course, you guys. Great. Yeah. And uh, you can keep following this expedition. Uh, follow the hashtag Pacific Seamounts 2021. You can follow the live stream as well, oceannetworks.ca, uh, Pacific Seamounts 2021. And you can continue to ask questions uh, using Slido. And those links will be put in the chat for you. And last but not least, if you're interested in connecting during other expeditions, um, there's uh, another one coming up of, with Ocean Networks Canada, where you can uh, register at nautiluslive.org slash education slash slash ship to shore interactions. I know that's a mouthful, but that will also appear in the chat. Um, and the connections there are free. You can also watch online as that happens. Um, I, I did want to circle back to just one small note about talking about what age can you can get involved. And with some of these videos, um, you can get involved as soon as you look. We've had citizen scientists who are quite young because they have taken the time to say, yeah, I want to watch that expedition. I want to watch that video. And I'm going to ask what is that? What's over there? And so always encouraging people to join us in that way and, and never be shy. If you see something and you want to know more about it, uh, do contact us because you might see something we've never seen before. Great. Uh, and again, uh, many thanks for joining us and your questions. Um, you can continue to ask those questions through Slido. Uh, we do need to end our broadcast today. So thank you again for joining us and everyone have a wonderful summer. Take care. <laughs>